up to the workers. They decide where they want to put their profits. If they're earning money, do they want to put it more into wages? Do they want to put it towards benefits? It's all up to them, and they sit down every week and hash it all out. Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. In 2008, the workers at this Windows factory occupied their plant to resist being laid off by their boss. Ever since, they've worked towards creating a worker-owned cooperative, and that's just what they've done. They may not be selling millions of windows yet, but they're well on their way. And the fact that they're here at all is a survival story. We've been following it for seven years. Leia Fried is director of international strategies for UE, the union that's represented these workers since before they first occupied what was then the Republic Windows and Doors factory. The workers saw their workplace close. They occupied for six days, won a settlement, but then didn't have jobs. Amazingly enough, another company bought it, agreed to hire everybody back, recognized the union, recognized the contract, and then a couple years later they closed. During the second occupation, um, the workers had gone through a process uh, of realizing that they needed to have a little bit more control over their lives and that a co-op was something they were interested in possibly launching. And so during that second occupation, which happened in February 2012, one of the demands they made was that the company had to sell and possibly sell to the workers if no one else was interested. And that began this very long process. Now, three years later, we're here. They're making windows. They're selling them. They're making a little bit of money and growing, which is amazing. But really, this is a story, I think, about um, when you struggle, you can win. And this is the first machine we start on, on the factory. This one, what, it, what this machine do is uh, wash the glass. Early on, Armando Robles envisioned owning the factory. But it hasn't been easy. I visited his home and spoke to his family about the struggles they faced as he and his co-workers transitioned from workers to worker owners. It, it was kind of hard because sometimes we didn't have, we, it's like we have to limit ourselves for a lot of stuff. Like we, you know, sometimes we didn't have enough to buy grocery or either it's grocery or pay bills or either one thing or another thing. And it was kind of hard. It was getting harder and harder. But then, you know, my kids would tell me, Mom, don't worry. We're going to get out of this. We're going to get out of this. This season, the, the, the one we just passed is really, uh, it was really kind of uh, slow. But we maintain our, our hope and we're still working in the factory, uh, dedicating the most time we can in, in, in the factory. We could see around the, the city a lot of uh, struggle. We have the people from the fast food, fast food uh, restaurants fighting for 15 an hour. Having uh, four, three children, my wife and myself work in, in the house. And working both, is, is, it's kind of hard. It's kind of hard to pay the rent. It's kind of hard to, to, to afford to have a, a, a good, a decent life. You and I first talked, I think, in the fall of 2008 as the occupation oh, yeah. was happening. Yeah. Did you, I mean, those were tough times. There were it half was, a million people being yeah. laid out of work, laid off work every month. Mm -hmm. Most people were just going home. Mm -hmm. These workers decided not to do that. They were pissed. But did you ever imagine anything like this? I've known them all for quite a while, and I have to say, they have taken on this challenge and grown so much and learned so much and been able to handle so much. They have figured out accounting, they do sales, um, you know, and they've learned not only skills within the factory, I mean, they all know how to do everything practically, and, uh, and also in the office, but they've also gained this incredible confidence. Like, they just, they've got this. When I think for a lot of folks, they look to New Era and they say, this could be my life. I could make a living wage. I could be in control of my life um, and are really inspired by it. And we really want to share that experience as much as possible. We invite people to come visit the factory. The factory is kind of open to everybody, unless you're a former owner of Republic Windows and Doors, in which case you're not invited. Um, but, you know, it's, the doors are open for people to come and learn and, and see what's possible. So you like being a business owner? Or business owner? Yes, I really do. Great. Does it feel different? Yes.
Yeah. Like a whole lot, lot different. Do you stay so up at night worrying like Armando used to? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was worried not too long ago until oh, yeah. we started getting these orders in. So what would you say are the biggest challenges New Era is facing? The fact that they're competing with these low-wage companies, you know. Ron Spielman, who used to own Republic Windows and Doors, started a window factory. All the workers are temps. They make minimum wage. There's no health insurance. There's no benefits. And so even if you have a co-op that pays a living wage and can function because they don't have the overhead of crazy boss salaries, um, you're still in competition with all these folks that are depressing wages. A lot of these businesses, their business model is based on wage theft. Um, and there's also a great deal of discrimination. I mean, a lot of Temp agencies will straight up say, I only want young women. Mm -hmm. Totally disgusting. And it's all because the supervisors like to be around young women. It's gross, so they can sexually harass them. Um, sometimes they say they only want Latino workers. They won't hire black workers. Well. Monday, Monday we started uh, the biggest order ever. 580 women we started. And uh, we've already had some large orders like this order. Here's a 60 window order. Co-ops are one of many tactics that we employ in a strategy to overcome the abuses of capitalism. Cooperatives can be uh, an answer in a very specific situation like ours, where we saw the company close and we seize an opportunity with an organized workforce to, to take control. But co-ops can't be the only answer. The reality is we need a vibrant labor movement, and that doesn't necessarily mean only traditional unions. You know, obviously I'm with UE, I'm with a, a traditional union. I like to organize workers and negotiate contracts, but being part of the labor movement means organizing workers in many different forms, whether it's a non-majority movement like Warehouse Workers for Justice or the Fight for 15 um, or the domestic workers, which are all examples of workers getting organized outside of that traditional model. Any message to anyone out th to workers out there maybe in a struggle or seeing one down the road? The answer is always to organize. You are not the only one going through what you're going through and uh, seek out your coworkers form a union, get together, think about starting a co-op, but be part of something bigger than yourself because alone we change nothing, but together we can transform the world.